All right, welcome to Computer Science E75. My name is David Malin. I'll be your instructor this semester. This is lecture zero, where we lay the foundation for the course and focus on HTTP and some higher level protocols. But what we will also do tonight is give you a taste of the course, uh, give you a sense of what to expect, uh, what the course will cover, and perhaps either uh, win you over right now or make you realize maybe this wasn't, in fact, the course you should be shopping today. So I actually think this course is a lot of fun. Um, the types of students that we typically get are students who have some programming background, whether it's here at DCE having taken E50A, E50B, so you have a couple of semesters of Java or some other language under your belt. We have folks who, have, who work full time as developers, not necessarily in PHP and with web-based languages, but with C, C++, C Sharp, or the like. So we get a range of students. I would say if you're in the former camp where you have just a little bit of programming experience, you'll definitely end up working more in the course, um, working a little harder, because I'm going to need to assume certain things about students in in this course. So if you right now don't know what a hash table is, well, you're either going to, one, need to take some other course first, or frankly, just Google it after tonight and quickly read up on what it is and make sure you're comfortable with picking up things uh, on your own, bootstrapping yourself, so to speak. But we're going to assume from day one that you know what programming is. No matter what language you've come from, so long as it's a fairly recent or modern high-level language, Java, C++, JavaScript, PHP, Perl, Python, any of these kinds of languages, you should be fine. Um, and I would say even if you have some familiarity with the course's material, that we're going to cover a whole bunch of stuff this semester, really from soup to nuts, low level to high level, uh, so that ultimately we have some really nice working software. Um, the course's focus, as we'll see in a little bit, is structured around five projects, uh, four of which we assign, one of which you come up with on your own. And the climax of this course is what we've dubbed uh, Computer Science Fair, where the students in this course, whether local or ideally distant, uh, will drop by campus uh, on May 18th. We'll have a couple of hours together jointly with another course called uh, Computer Science E7, Digital Photography. And it will really be a chance to see some faces that you may not see for several weeks after tonight, as always is the case, given that the course is online. Um, and it will be an exhibition of your final projects. Everyone will bring in a laptop, or we'll bring in some Entenmann's cake, some drinks, um, and we will all mingle and sort of uh, take delight in what you all have pulled off by semester's end. So we hope you'll stay with us. Um, before we dive into some of the course's uh, expectations and structure, why don't we start with something a little more basic and see if we can get some of the, uh, let's see if we can level the playing field a little bit and also fill in some gaps that you might have in your own knowledge. So ultimately, this course is about building uh, dynamic, scalable websites. So first, what does that mean? Well, dynamic in the sense that we're not just going to be coding up HTML-based pages and CSS, cascading style sheets pages, that you might have the very first time that you did a little bit of website development. This is more of a web programming course, where it's dynamic in that you'll be using PHP, and you'll be using JavaScript. And in theory, anytime someone, you or someone else, visits a website or a project that you've made in this course, the content is going to change because of the user who is logged in or because of the time of day based on the current events, as you'll see, based on the content of the course. Um, so they'll be dynamic in that you will be doing a little bit of work to create a much more dynamic, much more interesting user experience. Scalability will be a topic that we lace throughout the course. So there are um, a number of areas that we'll cover in the course, um, not only related to programming, but also to how you go about building out an infrastructure. So it's great if your website can support you and perhaps your family and friends at home. But it's a much harder, it's a much more interesting problem if you now need to scale to hundreds of users, or thousands of users, or even more than that. So we'll talk throughout the course, but particularly at the end of the course, about what it takes to actually build a scalable website that can handle thousands or even tens of thousands of users, what kind of software you need to use, what kind of hardware that you need to use. That's OK. We'll do this, I think, during the break, if you don't mind. So thanks. So let's begin then with DNS. So you pull up a web browser, and you type in something like google.com. What actually happens when you hit Enter? And there's clearly a hint up here on the board. The answer is DNS. What was really the question then? Sorry? Yeah, exactly. So the name gets resolved, so to speak. So there's this really nice system in this world known as DNS, the domain name system. And most of us, if you're not familiar with it, uh, technically, you're certainly familiar with it as a user, because it's the system that allows us to translate uh, fully qualified host name or fully qualified domain names or uh, host names, English words, something like CNN.com, Google.com, Yahoo.com, into a numeric address that is actually useful to computers. So it's similar in spirit 
to uh, telephone number. So we all probably know of 1-800-COLLECT, even if you've not ever used it. Even I don't know what it is, 1-800-something, right? Three digits and another four digits. But it's useful to think of it as 1-800-COLLECT because we as humans can remember these names much more easily than the fairly random sequence of digits that constitute the phone number. So similar on the internet. What does every computer on the internet have that actually makes the internet work? Yeah, so an IP address. And it's an IP, an IP address is simply a number of the form x.y.z.w, where each of those placeholders is some number between, random trivia? Zero and 255. Yeah, 0 and 255. Now, take comfort in that if you don't quite know these details yet, that's fine. And arguably, you don't need to know them in order to get dynamic websites up and running. You don't need to know them from a developer's perspective. But this course is not only about teaching you, say, PHP or JavaScript, but really giving you a sense from, again, the ground up how all of this stuff works so that you exit this course a little more learned in a whole range of topics, among them this one. So why is this useful? Well, one of the things that's particularly fun we think about this course is that rather than put you on some sandbox, some server called uh, whatever.harvard.edu and give you an account so that ultimately your website's URL is something like fas.harvard.edu slash tilde mailin, which really isn't compelling and certainly not memorable, we're going to have you as part of Project Zero, which will be distributed next week, buy your own domain name. And if you've not done this before, not terribly hard at all. There are dozens, hundreds even, of internet registrars these days. One of the biggest is called GoDaddy. And for $6.95, $9.95, you'll be asked to buy your own domain name, perhaps a vanity domain name, davidmalin.com happens to be taken, although there's not really anything there. Um, but you'll be encouraged to choose whatever name you want, because then what we will have you do with that domain name is point it by way of the DNS system to the course's server. So the course itself has its own server, and what its own IP address and what its host name is really isn't all that interesting, because we are going to, so to speak, virtually host all of your websites on the same box. We seem to have been left in a worse place than when we began. Uh, let's see if that fixes that. Uh, so we will have you set up uh, with very precise instructions in Project Zero's specification next week, um, just a couple of settings whereby you're going to go to GoDaddy.com, a process that is going to feel a little something like this. You'll be welcome to use, if you wish, any other registrar. Uh, the upside of GoDaddy is that they're one of the largest, and they are, they are good. They are good, but they literally try to upsell you at every step of the way. And from the chuckles, it sounds like some of you have used GoDaddy before. As if their website's any indication, even I, just the other day, was trying to buy an SSL certificate and was given two dozen other add-on features, like email inboxes and a whole slew of other features that really I didn't need. I just needed an SSL certificate, something we'll discuss later in the course, but again, they try to catch you uh, at every step of the way. So if you do go follow our directions precisely in Project Zero and buy from these guys, look for or control F4 the no thanks link on most every page, and you'll finally click your way through. But we want to buy a domain name. Well, the first thing I went with, say, back in the day was David Malin, and then from the dropdown, it appears that you have a whole slew of options these days. I mentioned .com. What are some others, again, answers already on the board, that you can buy these days? OK, so .org, there's some familiar ones. Uh, .net, .us, dot... OK, so not so much edu, unless you actually run your own university or some uh, scholastic enterprise right now. So there are some restrictions. You also cannot buy, for instance, another popular one. Uh, dot, uh, dot gov. So if you visited whitehouse.gov just a few days ago, it was overhauled literally within minutes of 12 noon. Um, you yourself could not procure, most likely, a dot gov or even a dot mil domain. And sort of as an aside, it's kind of a curious thing that most every popular website that we Americans are familiar with ends in dot com and dot net uh, and dot org. And yet if you go abroad, then you're kind of stuck with the dot co dot uk or dot co dot jp for the uk and japan respectively. Why is it that we apparently don't have dot us as the suffix of most of our domains? Yeah, that's kind of it, right? We built it, we got there first, and it's really everyone else now that has to be slotted into these uh, CC TLDs, country code top level domains. So you fortunately have the choice of a whole bunch of uh, sites, including in other countries. In fact, uh, we, for instance, own CS75.tv for the course's podcast, for the course's video content, just because we think it's 
cool uh, for a few dollars a year to say go to cs75.tv to actually view videos. But all of these two character uh, TLDs, top level domains, actually belong to countries. So TV, nice as it is, it doesn't mean television. What does it mean? Transylvania. Not Transylvania. <laughs> That's not bad. Yeah, Tuvalu. It's a small uh, South Pacific island nation that decided it could turn a few bucks by actually selling off the rights to their domain name because much of the English-speaking world thinks of TV as television, and so they've really capitalized on this. In fact, it doesn't cost us $9.95 a year for CS75.tv. They, they kind of nail you. It's like $29.95. So I'm sure in a class of 100 plus students, there'll be some of you that go for the more interesting domains, but any of these CCTLDs, .at, .be, .cc, and the list appears to go on, these actually belong to countries. And so this is good if you want to have an international presence, or if you're being sort of of the delicious type website flavor, or the .t TV flavor, at least you can be playful with the names you choose. But the takeaway for us is that you're going to buy one of these domain names. Unfortunately, davidmalin.com is probably taken, whereas malin.com has been owned by some squatters for some number of years. Um, you'll see here that I, <laughs> feel free to try back ordering it, and eventually when the novelty wears off, maybe uh, uh, you will in fact get it for $18.99. You have .info, .me, .mobi. So there's been this proliferation as the domain name space has gotten eaten up and as the markets for this stuff has grown. But what you're going to do ultimately for this first project is you're going to click Submit and check out at some point along the way, and you're going to then own, at least for a year, a domain name. And it's pretty simple what you then need to do. All you need to do at that point is tell via the appropriate link on GoDaddy or whomever's site who the name servers are for your domain. So there's this whole infrastructure on the internet, again called DNS, Domain Name System, whose purpose in life is to translate IP addresses to host names and vice versa. So Google.com to its IP address and vice versa. So someone needs to know what servers on the internet actually are capable of this mapping. Now ultimately it's going to be our CS75 server that knows all about your domain names and can tell the world, oh, davidmalin.com is at x.y.z.w. But you need to tell the world that they need to ask our servers this question, what is the IP address of your domain name, so that when your, your mother, your child, your friend tries to pull up your own domain name after this course, something.com, well, some, your browser is going to contact, say, Comcast's DNS server. Comcast, the very first time you ask this question, probably isn't going to know about little old you on our core server, so they, in turn, are going to recursively ask someone else, perhaps these things called root servers, of which there are at least 13 in the world that know where all of the .coms are, where all of the .nets are. So it's all very hierarchical, ultimately. And eventually, Comcast's DNS server is going to figure out, oh, the IP address of something.com is currently at 1.2.3.4, a server that happens to be owned by Harvard University. Your browser is then going to know, oh, I, don't, I now need to send this request, yes, to something.com, but more specifically to 1.2.3.4. And thanks to the world of TCP IP networking, uh, on which you can take entire classes, the request will leave your computer, go out on the internet, hit our servers, your pages will be generated via PHP, be spit back out over the internet, will arrive on that same user's browser, and ultimately render. So the one step that needs to happen before then is you'll need to tell GoDaddy or the equivalent that the name servers for something.com, as you'll see, will be ns1.cs75.net and ns2. .cs75.net. And again, we'll, we'll hold your hands with these sort of boring details in the problem set specification, but that's it. After that, you have effectively, by way of GoDaddy or in turn network solutions, informed the world who it is that can answer questions of the form, what is something.com's IP address? And then we will sort of take it from there. So any questions, um, albeit at this high level, of what DNS is and why it matters when you're actually building dynamic websites? Yeah. A final address in the in uh, what kind of address? IP address or? I was buying a name to go to my home computer. I didn't have. A... Ah, interesting. So yes, in theory, you could do. 
you could use, so GoDaddy themselves runs their own name servers. And so the question here is, if you didn't have, say, a course affiliation, or maybe after tonight won't have a course affiliation, but you nonetheless want to do this sort of thing, you can actually tell GoDaddy not what name servers to inform the world of, but you can hard code the IP address at which your server lives. And GoDaddy calls it uh, total DNS, just their silly marketing term for just their DNS servers. So whether it's GoDaddy or any other registrar, yes, you can hard code your IP address. And so long as Comcast or Verizon or whomever isn't filtering out this kind of inbound HTTP traffic, it would work too. Other questions? No? All right. So, uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. If we've got this virtual server that's serving up all of them, mm -hmm. when the DNS server gives it the, uh, the IP address, mm -hmm. So that, all right, so very good question. And why don't we, for the sake of a, a teaser here, answer that right now? So to recap the question for the camera and those here, um, if all of you, all 100 plus students, have all 100 different unique domain names, and yet we're all, for efficiency and, and cost reasons, trying to keep you all on one server, well, how in the world is that server going to know to spit out foo.com instead of bar.com when some incoming request comes in if every incoming request apparently contains what? The same. IP address, right? So this is all thanks to a feature of modern web hosting called virtual hosting. So this didn't always exist. Back in the day when it was Apache web server software version 1.0 and Netscape 1.0 and very early on, um, browsers simply sent their requests, as we'll soon see, to a specific IP address. And what they got back is what the server was designed to spit out. Well, finally, over time, servers like Apache and Microsoft's IIS web server, just Win Linux versus uh, Windows alternatives to web server software, decided, well, one, this is kind of silly. I mean, we have all these spare cycles over time, and this is software. We can make it do most anything we want. Why don't we try hosting multiple sites per server? To do this, the browser needs to cooperate. So what we'll actually see in a moment when I sniff some of my own web traffic here is that in addition to a request that your browser is sending to a specific IP address, it's also sending a little hint in what's called the HTTP, among the HTTP headers. It's just one line of text that we'll see says host colon, and then whatever it was the user literally typed into the browser, whether it's foo.com or bar.com. So let's go ahead and take a look, actually. If I pull up um, this wonderful Firefox plugin called Live HTTP Headers, this free piece of software um, simply uh, sniffs, so to speak, all of the traffic that my browser is sending out on the internet and the responses that are coming back. So it's sort of exposing some of the low-level details that you, yourself, the user, don't normally see. Let me go to a fairly familiar website, google.com, hit enter, and what just flew across this screen are all of the HTTP headers. Now, most of these we're going to ignore. Like, here's a request apparently related to the favorite icon. Uh, fave.ico file, which gives you the little silly logo on the top of a page. If we scroll up, we're probably going to see something like, yep, nav logo 3.ping. So this is maybe Google's logo. So apparently, one simple request to google.com resulted in multiple requests, kind of recursively, because again, google.com, like most sites, has multiple images and sometimes cascading style sheets, JavaScript, and stuff like this. So we only care for now in answer to this question about the first one. So let me scroll on back up. Let me zoom in. And notice the following. So again, some of this is just formatted to be consistent with what whoever wrote this software wanted it to be. It's all kind of mashed together. But we can see at the top here, see, I am pointerless. So I will, oh, here we go. So what you see on the very first line of this tool, which we will uh, promote constantly throughout the course, because it's actually a wonderful debugging tool as you're developing stuff. Um, this is what I typed into my browser. This first line is literally what my browser sent to Google.com server. So this is when we say that uh, computers understand HTTP, Hypertext Transfer Protocol, what we mean is that they know how to spit out lines of text like this. And in fact, before we go too far with this verbally, HTTP, what is it in, say, an English sentence? OK, yes, Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Good, but I knew that already. What else is it? Plain text. Yeah, so it's plain text, but more specifically, like. Why does it exist? Who speaks it? Who uses it? 
Yeah, so browser. So it's, let's summarize it as it's the language that web browsers and web servers speak at this so-called application level. And if you've taken a networking course, you know that there's this, the ISO model or the, the seven-layer ISO model or the five-layer TCP IP model. If you don't know this background, that's fine, but you're probably familiar with the idea of HTTP. It's, if you're not already, you're about to be. And it's the language that browsers and servers speak with one another. But somehow those messages need to go across the whole internet. And the language or languages or protocols more formally that get data, no matter what kind of data it is, from point A to B is TCP IP, or more specifically TCP and IP. Below that, if you're familiar, uh, networking layers, or, um, so Ethernet. So there's a whole bunch of technologies, but our focus in this course, for the most part, will be at the topmost application layer, HTTP. So it's the protocol that uh, browsers and servers speak. So what my browser literally sent to Google.com was that first line, get forward slash, forward slash denoting the root of the hard drive, the root of the web server, the version of HTTP that it's speaking, which is either 1.0 or 1.1. And here is the short answer to the question. It also sends this line. So that if Google just so happened to be in the business of hosting not only its own website, but foo.com and bar.com, the web server is going to check that second line, host colon, and figure out what website it should actually dish out. Now, Google presumably has dedicated hardware, so that's only the only website there. And we'll eventually come back and look at some of these other headers. But for now, they're not terribly enlightening. But the response from the server is kind of interesting. Notice that apparently. Google's web server spit out this. What does this seem to imply about Google's servers or their marketing people? Yeah, so apparently Google or the, the powers that be decided our brand will be www.google.com. Maybe for some uh, low level technical reasons, but also for branding reasons. And so apparently what their server spit out is not actually the web page, but instead this header http colon slash slash www.google.com. And what that means is that the next thing my browser probably did, yep, look at this, the next one down, the next request, is now to what Google just told me to go to. So we'll actually use this trick a lot. When you're implementing your own websites and you want to bounce the user from one page to another, the trick that we um, that will commonly use is to spit out precisely that header, location, colon, something. And that will t almost always have the effect of bouncing the user to some URL. But there's some interesting gotchas and uh, perhaps security implications that we'll stumble across. So excellent. Questions on DNS or HTTP here? Yeah. Oh, it's a good question. You're going to challenge my acronyms here now, though. So there are a number of nonprofit entities within the world. The IANA, um, the Internet Assigned Numbers Authority, takes care of the regulation of IP addresses. And the answer, the right acronym to spit out is escaping me for the other. But it is an organizing body, essentially, of volunteers that um, sanction who exactly is allowed to talk directly to the root servers and thus program them with additional domain names. Uh, I can might very well be it. Let me take the fifth for just a, a till break time, so I don't speak the wrong one. But I presume that a company like that has to pay them. They don't go out and sell. I presume that's how the relationships work. Yes, these registrars, which have exploded in recent years, because back in the day it was just network solutions who did this. Um, it's exploded into a whole bunch of mom and pops out there. GoDaddy is not, we have no ties to them, but we preach them just because they're the biggest and frankly, they're what I've used for years. And once you're kind of there, it's kind of nice to stay with them. So if you don't want to stay with them, start with someone else. OK, so this is just a quick um, summary of some of the things we already saw in that drop down list. But the next question at hand is, all right, so you're not necessarily taking this course. And therefore, you'd like some of its le uh, you're not going to be taking this course forever. And it'd be nice if the lessons are applicable beyond the scope of the course, because you're not forever going to have our server, CS75.net. So this is actually why we use this notion of virtual hosting and actually have you buy your own domain names for the course so that what you're learning, what you're taking away from the course is completely transferable to most any other standard environment, whether it's on your own servers at some office or some other commercial web host that you might pay a few dollars or a few hundred dollars a year um, to actually host your real website after the course. So what I pulled up here is a screenshot of a popular web host just to give you a sense of what you get these days, but also to point out uh, caveat emptor. So all of this is just $5.95 per month. Uh, this is a popular 
a web host called DreamHost, actually, which some of you might have heard of. And it's literally $5.95 a month for this, this particular site, but I think only if you commit to like three or five years. So it's a little misleading at first glance, but there are many such operations out there these days. Anyone with a, web, a, anyone with a server and anyone with a constant uh, internet connection can set up shop these days on the internet as a web host. Well, what does that mean? It means they can provide you with one, hosting of your website. They can provide you with email services, email list services, Usenet services, any type of internet service you can imagine these days. Little old you can run this from your own home, from your own apartment, from that comp spare computer under your desk. But we bring this up now just to point out that it's wonderful, yes, to be able to spend I think I've seen deals like $5 per year to host your domain name on the internet. Well, you're typically going to get what you pay for. And one of the reasons we don't use some of these cheapo hosts out there is because we have much more control over running our own web server for the course. And so what we actually are using for the course, and you could too after a course like this, is we actually are paying on a monthly basis for what's called a VPS, a virtual private server. And thanks to the proliferation of um, or rather the decreasing costs of memory, RAM these days, the numbers of cores that are increasing in uh, servers today. What a lot of people have done to set up shop out there these days is to take a really souped up computer. Maybe it's got eight cores, sort of eight CPUs, 16 gigs, 32 gigabytes of RAM, and they run software like VMware on it, or Virtuoso, or uh, Zen. These are all virtual machine platforms, and they chop up their server, so to speak, into the illusion of multiple servers, each one of which has its own hard drive or illusion thereof, each one of which has its own 4 gigabytes or 10 gigabytes of RAM, and each of which has its own installation of Linux. So in fact, that's precisely what we have for the course. We have a VPS, a virtual private host. It's a virtual machine that's running Linux, uh, CentOS 5, I believe. But we have root access over it, which is wonderful because it means we, the course, can do anything we want with this server, in theory, without impacting any of the other customers this particular company, Servant, has running on that same physical hardware. And there's some amazing things you can do these days. They don't use this particular software, but if you're running VMware or other variants of the same technology, you can literally move a server, whether it's a web server, an email server, or anything else, from one physical machine to another physical machine, even without users noticing. Perhaps a few milliseconds of a blip would actually happen, but the technologies have gotten so sophisticated that this ability to virtualize not only your website in the HTTP sense, but also in the hardware sense, is a very powerful thing. And so what we excerpted here, just to give you a sense of what we are paying for and what you after a course like this could pay for if you wanted these same guarantees is we're actually getting academic pricing otherwise this would get very expensive quickly for us um, four gigabytes uh, two gigabytes of guaranteed ram 100 gigabytes of storage space four ip addresses clearly not enough ip addresses for everyone in this room but that's okay thanks to modern implementations of http and a whole bunch of other stuff and these particular guys have been very reliable but the point that's worth making here too is that in some sense you shouldn't care even about any of these details. Certainly if you're a web developer or developer more generally, I mean, there's sort of um, uh, lines of abstraction drawn between a lot of these roles where you just need an account. You need to be able to SSH and SFTP into some home directory where you can put your web content, your PHP files, and that's precisely ultimately what you'll be doing in this course. Because what we run on top of this VPS, as is very popular these days, is what's called a panel. So there's a whole bunch of popular tools for this. cPanel is one, if you've heard of it. Plesk is another. Downside is they're both very expensive. Sort of the third most popular out there is the software called DirectAdmin, um, which we use for two reasons. One, they kindly provide it to us um, uh, gratis for the university. But also, it's the simplest. Frankly, I use cPanel on a, a VPS of my own, and it's a nightmare. I don't know why it's the most popular out there. It does everything. But I am constantly just control Fing just to find features in the software because its design is not particularly well done, I would say. This is the interface that you'll play with, um, not terribly often, pretty much once per project so that you can set up your new website. But it's very simple. And it's going to give you control over DNS records. So you can have multiple domain names like, uh, or multiple host names like a website uh, project1.cs. Uh, 
foo.com, project two dot foo.com, project three dot foo.com. So each of your projects will actually be isolated to its own subdomain so that you can still think of all of your websites being at the root of some website in forward slash, so to speak, but they'll live inside separate subdirectories. And so that's one of the features you get with virtual hosting, like Apache, but we'll have a nice GUI wrapper on this. So in fact, just to give you a taste of this, I'll go ahead and pull up right now panel.cs75.net. You too will ultimately have an account on here. I'm going to go ahead and log in and we'll see pretty much that same interface. And you'll see that apparently I, uh, my David Malin account, have used 158 megs out of my 500 possible. Apparently I have unlimited bandwidth, but it clearly doesn't matter since I'm barely scratching it. My website, davidmalin.com, fortunately not very popular. Two email accounts, some other stuff. But there's going to be some powerful things here. In fact, why don't we use this as a way of tying these two discussions together? This is the view of, my, of our server's DNS configuration. So we said a while ago, uh, said a few minutes ago, that DNS again maps host names to uh, IP addresses and back. Well, how does that work? And in fact, how are you going to actually tell the the world knows, thanks to your configuration of your registrar? who to ask for the IP address of project1.foo.com and project2.foo.com. But you actually have to have an answer waiting for the world. And that answer is going to be waiting on this server. We ourselves are not going to set these up for you um, ourselves automatically. We're going to have you actually click the appropriate link, like I just did, DNS management. You'll see a screen like this. And apparently, I've been playing around before then, because I apparently have a whole bunch of host names already configured. Well, let's see if we can't tease some of these things apart. Uh, apparently, the IP address of uh, oh my other vanity domain, uh, malinrouge.com. Uh, I was not so clever. A friend came up with that name, and I, I jumped on it. Um, it. What is the IP address? Softball question of malinrouge.com. Apparently, yeah. So 64.131.79.130, and I'm just looking here. I'm following the line over here, and indeed, that's the IP address. And this isn't a typo. Um, by convention, the software that drives many implementations of DNS on Linux servers do intentionally end with a period after the domain name to demark this is not a host name, this is a full domain name. So realize that too. Um, and incidentally, the reason that these GUIs, these panels, cPanel, Plesk, DirectAdmin are so wonderful, I think at least, is because it hides a lot of the very ugly configuration files that are still with us today today on um, Linux in particular. And this isn't to say that this, is, um, this has changed the underlying server that we're using. If you're familiar with these terms, and you will be more over time, we're still running on this machine Linux in the form of CentOS, which is a variant of Red Hat Linux. We are still running Apache, which is free web server software. We are still running BIND, B-I-N-D, a Berkeley Internet Name Database, which is the implementation on Linux of DNS. This is just a prettier interface to that same software. Because uh, there was a time not so long ago where uh, design of configuration files was perhaps not a priority. And you have nasty looking things that tools like this, frankly, just simplify and make them much easier to tinker with. What about the IP address of www.mailinrouge.com, apparently? Yeah, so it's apparently the same thing. So even I got lazy, or I just want both to actually work. So dub, 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 and it's now implied that this lives in the same domain name of whatever uh, domain I'm currently configuring, which is in fact malinrouge.com. Apparently this too maps to this IP address. And now notice that there's actually a pattern here. All of these things we looked at uh, in the top of this table are what are called A records. And there's really two types of DNS records that you need to be concerned about, at least for the first project. And that's these things called A records. And quite simply, they are what literally map a host name or a full domain name to an IP address. So it's an, uh, an A record. By contrast, there's this thing called C name or canonical name. A C name is simply an alias. So what you can actually do is this. I could have changed this uh, data. I could have changed this configuration file to say, you know what, www yes should go to 64.131.79.130. But there's a slight nuisance here. If I ever change the IP address of my website because the person I move it to a different server, or I'm informed by the sysadmins, hey, you got to change your IP address for whatever technical reasons, what's the implication? 
I've got you know, twice as much editing to do, right? Because then I now have to change both of these records. Now, who really cares in the case of two records? But if you're talking about large websites or corporate uh, domains where you might have a whole bunch of subdomains, a whole bunch of servers, minor headache to actually go in and change multiple places. So C names are useful because I could have just created a C name for dub 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 and actually done this. So if I scroll down here, the interface that DirectAdmin gives us is this. I could have just said dub dub dub. Uh, is a C name for this domain name and click add, I would get a row uh, very similar to the one above, but instead, actually I can do it even though we're kind of violating, yep, we're violating the constraint that there's already an A record, but we would get a row in the table that just said dub 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 uh, space C name space mailinrouge.com period, and it would be an alias. Now if you really think hard now, there is perhaps a downside to this, especially in the context of, the hint is scalability. What's the downside might you infer of using C names as opposed to A records to implement DNS mappings? Yeah, so multiple lookups. So you get this convenience of one name resolving to another and then another goes finally to the IP address. But the implication of that is that now if you have a very popular website and people are all of a sudden hammering your site, maybe because of some slash dot effect, something you did is really cool, got slash dotted, you have all these people for the very first time visiting your website. Well, the first time they hit enter pulling up foo.com, their computer through some sequence of recursive steps is going to ask our server, What's, foo.com, let's, what's www.foo.com's IP address? We're going to say, I don't know, go ask foo.com for its IP address. So they're going to get that response. They're going to make the next request, thereby doubling the number of DNS queries that's hitting my server. For low volume websites, not really a big deal. But again, these are the kinds of subtleties that you need to start thinking about if you're paying for bandwidth or if you're just trying to sustain as many connections as possible. So using A records are better perhaps for performance if a bit of a pain for the sysadmin for that simple reason. You have, in this case, the number of hits your DNS servers are going to take. So if you had an A record for mailin.com as well, then that row with dub, dub, dub would apply to both of them? Uh, good question. So this page, by default, my mailin account that I logged in as only has one domain, mailinrouge.com. So anything that's not qualified here refers to mailinrouge.com. If I had a separate domain altogether, I would have, on the previous page, had to choose between my domain names. So this is just mailinrouge.com's uh, DNS configuration file. Now, um, last semester, actually, I got a little playful during class. And I, it was one of those demos where I kind of crossed my fingers and hoped it would work. And it did. So I left it here. So this is kind of a curious thing. I decided in lecture zero of last year, you know what, I am going to, in five seconds flat, reinvent CNN.com and call it to my own. Well, how did I do this? Well, one, with a little luck of CNN not really caring, apparently, to filter out things like this. And we'll see if it still works today. But I apparently created a C name record just by filling in this trivial little form. Super News, which was my, I decided supernews.mailinrouge.com shall be an internationally known website now. Uh, it's a C name for CNN.com. So what this means now is if I type in, let's see if it still works, supernews.mailinrouge.com and hit enter, my browser is going to ask Harvard's local DNS server, what's the IP address for this? Someone's eventually going to respond with, oh, well, it's the IP address of CNN.com. Go figure that out. My browser or maybe one of the DNS servers will do this for me. We'll go figure out what the IP address is of CNN.com. So the answer is going to come back to me for CNN.com's IP address. I'm going to hit enter, and apparently, supernews.mailinrouge.com in fact lives. Now what actually got sent, it's always, I really should choose a new demo because every time you choose a news website, how many eyes are now skimming the headlines, yes? So I, I don't learn from mistakes very well. But let's do this one more time with the live HTTP headers plugin installed. I'm going to just hit reload so I get all this stuff flashing up here. And let's just see what the first, well apparently what the second request was. A lot of ads came down first. Let's go ahead and try to clear, when in doubt, especially in this class when you're trying to do stuff, clear your private data so you get a fresh lookup altogether. Let me clear these results. CNN, uh, nope, supernews.mailinrouge.com, enter. Okay, hopefully this is now a fresh set of, there's a lot of crap on their website is what, <laughs> is what this is saying. 
Let's scroll up here. OK, good. So now I have the true first query, just like our Google example. But notice that my browser, consistent with the spec, did in fact say, hey, I want the supernews.mailinrouge.com domain. But it appears that CNN just ignores that. They are apparently not in the virtual hosting business. So they are just assuming if any request came in on our servers, we are going to rewrite it for the user. And they went ahead and apparently responded with this message. So if you, the, the funny thing here is, it will be a good thing in this course if you never see this message, because that means everything's working OK. So HTTP code 200 is not something you often see. You probably often see on your travels on the internet a little something called 404, file not found, 403, forbidden, 501 is the worst, internal server error if you have that this semester. Good luck. Uh, but this one is good because what came after is the server's response and then later the actual contents of the web page, the HTML and all of that stuff. But apparently CNN didn't bother either for over reasons of oversight or maybe uh, laziness or just they don't care. It's just not an, uh, a feature they want to bother with. What could they have spit out to fix the branding of this page, which I apparently now own? Yeah, they could have done this HTTP 302, or there's another one, 301, that says this page has moved to HTTP colon slash slash CNN.com or www.cnn.com. So it's a funny thing. And one of the upsides of discussing even these low level details is there's a lot of websites out there that you have to type www.something.com in order for the darn thing to work. You can't just go to something.com. And the only reason, really, that doesn't work is because some sysadmin um, decided or just didn't realize that they need to add just one more DNS record for that whole thing to work. Now, they actually need to do one other thing. They also need to configure the web server, whether it's Apache or Microsoft's IIS, to know that this website lives at both www and just something.com. But it's not hard. Even that, too, as we'll see in a future lecture, is just one line of code. Um, so your, your homework for this week is to uh, find one such website out there on the internet that does not actually work for both www and the base form, the domain name. You don't have to look very hard. I'll give you that. Um, and I would say don't use Firefox and probably don't use Chrome. I think you have to use IE for this to work because now sort of to protect people from themselves, Firefox and I think Chrome and maybe Opera, just assume if you don't type in the www and the, uh, the domain name itself doesn't work, they just automatically insert it for you. So you get it for free. But I think if you use IE, it doesn't do that for you. You can find yourselves a domain. And again, don't look very far um, that this just doesn't actually work on. So just to recap, this is a lovely image from Wikipedia that someone drew uh, depicting exactly what happens when you try to pull up a website on Wikipedia. Well, this just makes clear the recursive nature here. And again, this isn't something you have to worry about, but you do need to make sure that, one, the registrar you used knows uh, whom to inform the world is your, are your DNS servers. That's one time only step. And two, you need to make sure the server on which your code is actually running has the appropriate DNS entries. And what ultimately happens, say in the case of Wikipedia, is DNS recursor. Suppose this is just your browser for a moment. The first request is going to be, um, where is uh, wikipedia.org? If your browser has no idea who in the world would know this, it can actually contact these things called the root servers, of which there's 13 or so these days. And they, again, are sort of the authorities at the very top of the world. They don't know about every little website, but they typically know about some part of the hierarchy, the dot coms, the dot nets. So in fact, in this case, at least when this person drew this sketch, the answer says, you know what? I don't know. Go ask this guy here, this IP address. And so it's a recursor, whether it's your browser or some other DNS server, like Harvard's DNS server or Comcast server, is that they're supposed to typically do these multiple queries for you so that you yourself obviously don't have to do these lookups. Eventually, apparently, you ask the .org name server. He will then say, oh, you know what? Try wikipedia.org's name server for their specific IP address. And so with each of these recursive lookups, you get closer and closer and closer to the answer. Now, this would suggest that the whole internet doesn't scale very well if only 13 servers know where everybody else is. So how does this all work, despite the billions of requests that go on every day. 
caching, right? So there's this other interesting takeaway and sort of lesson you need to bear in mind anytime you're developing a website where people care that it's actually alive, which might not be the case for individual homework assignments, but for real websites, you screw up DNS and your customers or your boss is going to be pretty ticked off at you, not just for a few seconds potentially, but for 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours, because a lot of uh, DNS servers out there on the internet take it upon themselves for largely good purposes to cache these answers. So they remember that foo.com is this IP address and bar.com is this IP address. And they remember that mapping for typically a separate four hours, maybe 24 hours, 48 hours, 72 hours. And even though when you configure your DNS server, you can specify, you know what, this should have a very short TTL, time to live, like 30 minutes, they don't have to respect that. So Comcast might take it upon itself just because they don't really care if you are sort of SOL for a day or two, because scalability wise, they benefit from caching things as long as possible. You have to realize that if you try to move your website from one IP to another, or you just make a mistake in a config file like that, and some users now have cached that answer, or some DNS servers have cached that answer, you're kind of going to be in an awkward situation. For typically people think, 72 hours. After 72 hours, DNS has propagated, so to speak, properly. But again, it's, it's really just a rule of thumb. There's no hard value. So just beware. Don't move your websites overnight and hope it's going to work the next day. Ideally, if you're ever transferring sites from one server to another, leave them up in both locations uh, somehow. Yeah? Uh, good question. Um, so these requests, when the, it's bouncing back and forth, to whom do the requests go? Short answer is it depends. So uh, uh, software that understands DNS doesn't have to do this recursive process. It can just return the answer and say, hey, you asked me the question. Go ask someone else now, is this picture is depicting? Most likely, that is what happens so that as much load is offloaded from these servers as possible. They return a response and say, you go figure it out now. But when you get closer to the user, like in the case of Comcast, odds are Comcast web, uh, DNS servers are probably doing the recursion for your browser just because then they're saving gratuitous packets across their network and thus saving money. But again, it's conjecture. It depends on the configuration of the server, how the recursion works. Other questions? OK, so it turns out there's a couple more DNS records that are useful if you care about services other than web. So there's also these DNS records called MX records or mail exchange records. So what's nice about direct admin, when we, when we will create your domain names for you on the server, you'll get a few entries for free. So I myself did not type in all of these DNS records here. Rather, I um, got a lot of them free. Just when I created my account with the tools here, we got a bunch of these. But clearly, I did not get super news for free. So I manually entered some of these in. But what I did get was something like MX. So apparently, what you get for free, and by this I mean with no effort on your part, is a record called mail.yourdomainname.com, or whatever domain you chose. It's of type MX. And 10. 10 is its value. So it turns out you can have multiple servers configured to handle the mail that's coming inbound to your domain name. Um, the, this number 10 is a priority. So you can have different numbers to give different weights to different servers. If you have a main web server, you'd give it one value. If you have another web server that you want to be the backup, you give it another value so that there's some hierarchy in it. We only have one uh, server that we're all using. And so if it goes down, everything, frankly, goes down, uh, sort of a risk we're willing to take in this context context, but there's only going to be one record then in this case. And what this means is that when users are trying to hit your domain, not with web requests, but with, say, sending an email, well, thanks to the SMTP protocol, with which you might be familiar, at least by acronym, um, your computer, whether it's running Outlook or Eudora or whatever mail client, is going to have to go through a similar sequence of steps. If I email, say, uh, 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 let's say, john at harvard.edu, well, my client's going to have to ask the world, well, one, what is the, uh, give, me the IP, give me the name servers for harvard.edu. And through a sequence of recursion, presumably, we're going to get back the answer of something like ns1.harvard.edu, ns2.harvard.edu. And my client's then going to say, oh, ns1.harvard.edu. I'll pick you first. What is the MX record for harvard.edu? And he is then going to respond with the IP address or domain name of whatever server now is responsible for mail at Harvard University. My email client should then go contact that guy to actually send out this particular mail. So if you've ever gotten an email message saying, 
uh, your message could not be delivered, but wait four more hours, we'll keep trying, keep trying. Among the things that server could be trying is different MX records, or maybe it's tried them all, and now it's just sleeping for some number of hours before it tries again. But mail, in short, is pretty resilient. And in part, that's thanks to DNS, because it, too, has its own uh, records for domains. And then there's a few other records, these TXT records, uh, PTR records, which have to do with IP mappings as well. But for the most part, at least for tonight, we'll focus on just the biggies, so to speak, the A names, C names, and in, to some extent, the MX records. And it's the A and the C names that, uh, from a developer's perspective, you'd probably be touching the most yourself. Any questions? OK, why don't we go ahead and take a five minute break. The teaching fellows and I are up front here. We'll introduce them in a bit. But feel free to mingle. Uh, feel free to take a five minute break. We'll come back, dive into a bit more of the server setup and also the course's uh, logistics and expectations. All right, we are back. Let's take a second to take the hood off of what we just did. So to recap, Direct Admin is just a panel. It's a nice GUI that makes people's lives, my own included, easier because you don't have to do things at the command line and it kind of simplifies. It gets rid of details that aren't just that interesting sometimes. But what I've just done is SSH. So I'm using a protocol now called Secure Shell. Um, if you're not familiar with this, you hopefully will become familiar with it for the course, even though you can get by without ever touching the command line, thanks to the panel. But what I have just done is using a free program called PuTTY, I have quote unquote SSH'd to CS75.net, which is the host name of the VPS on which all of your domain names will live. I could have SSH to MalinRouge.com because thanks to that IP address scheme, it actually resolves to the same machine that the course's website is running on. And soon, once you have your own domain names, you too could just SSH to CS75.net or to whatever your domain name is because they're all going to be living on the same physical virtual server. So what I have here is in slash var slash name D. So this is just a folder on the Linux hard drive here. I'm going to open up a file called apparently mailinrouge.com.db. So what direct admin is really doing for you, as is the case for cPanel, Plesk, and these other uh, panels, is they're just giving you a GUI wrapper for these low level configuration files, just these text files. So this is the config file that uh, bind, the name server on this machine, actually is using. And this is all I mean by complicated. Right? It's very easy at first glance to make a mistake in a file like this. And so this is why, frankly, panels are useful, or at least even I, as comfortable as I might be at the command line, even I'm going to screw up something that likes to have an at sign up there and some parentheses over there. But this is all that's being modified for you by the panel. So realize that while we are trying to simplify some details, it's really just a convenience and not because anything underneath the hood is fundamentally changed or fundamentally different from a real environment after the course that you might happen across. So what you see here now is that uh, how about this fourth entry, mailinrouge.com's um, a record is actually listed here in the syntax that's appropriate. This is actually the TTL in seconds, so it's just a few hours in this case here. Um, but again, it's not necessarily the case that every DNS server in the world is going to obey that. But there's, there is sort of a sweet spot, at least so far as your server is concer uh, concerned. You might think that, wow, I'd like to be really responsive to changes that are necessary. Let me give it a one minute TTL. You know, the downside of that is that your servers now are going to get hit almost every request, every day a user visits your site because their browser has just forgotten, so to speak, the IP address. So four hours tends to be what people consider to be reasonable these days, at least on the local server. So that's all that the panel is doing in the case of DNS for you. Um, SSH. So you may, uh, you will be encouraged to use SSH for the course, but even though you'll be expected to implement projects that ultimately live on CS75.net, albeit at your, your own domain name, um, you are quite welcome and encouraged to develop the projects not on our server, but on your own local machine uh, or even on some server that you have access to. So one of the free software packages that we'll preach in the course is actually called XAMPP, X-A-M-P-P. Uh, and it's linked on the course's website under software, uh, which I'll pull up in a moment. And this is just a really nice bundle of the Apache web server, of the PHP processor, of a tool called PHP MyAdmin, which makes it very easy to administer MySQL databases. And it comes with a whole bunch of other features. And the nice thing is, whether you're running Windows or Mac OS or even Linux, you double click an icon, follow some prompts, and voila, your computer has your very own web server, MySQL server, and a whole bunch of other stuff just running 
for you. So we also will make available a tutorial online. It's a one pager made by one of the teaching fellows, but that was a very popular option last year because you know, it's not necessarily that fun or familiar to do all of your work via a terminal window or using like a server side Emacs. You can use any tools you want on your own client side. And so long as you're remembering all the while that you probably shouldn't hard code URLs like C colon backslash whatever, but use relative URLs in theory, at least maybe you'll make a mistake the first time, you can then just upload your code to our server at your, in the appropriate subdirectory, uh, change the permissions on the files appropriately, and voila, it should work as well on the server as on your own box. So realize that you are welcome to use Macs, Linux boxes, Windows boxes, and in fact I would say a uh, significant majority of students last year decided to develop on their own machines just because they like their environment, they like their tools, and they like the speed with which they could interact with their code. But more on this as the projects themselves are released. If you do decide to use SSH. These are commands that you may or may not be familiar with. We can offer some additional counsel on these things called sections on them, but again, uh, it is not necessary for the course. You can pretty much work on any machine of your choice. If though you're going to be moving files around, I'll certainly use the acronym over time called SFTP, Secure File Transfer Protocol. So what you will get as part of Project Zero is a username and a password for CS75.net, aka soon your own domain name. So if you tried logging into the course's website already and nothing you've tried has worked, that's to be expected because you don't yet have this username and password. So once you submit Project Zero, which will be released on Monday, part of that project will have you tell us what your domain name is, what your username is going to be. We'll then respond with an email giving you the, uh, the information you need to know to get yourself up and running on our server. But for now, there's really nothing on the course's website that has password protection that you need. Um, so you're not, you're not already behind, so not to worry there. So SFTP just means to move files around. So if you do end up developing code on your own server uh, or your own machine, you will need to ultimately upload your code and your images and CSS and all that stuff to our server in order to run a command there to submit it. But even that can be done via direct admin. There's a nice button that says uh, uh, web FTP or something like that where you can upload your files via the web too. So there's a little something for everyone depending on your comfort levels in the course. So perfect segue then to what this course is all about and what we expect and what you should expect. So in terms of prereqs, we only assume of students that you come in knowing you know, a bit of HTML. You know what it is. You've made even some hideous websites, but you know what HTML is, tags, open brackets, all that kind of stuff. And that you're coming into the course with programming experience in some language. So anything high level. So Java, again, PHP, you'd have a slight advantage, but Java, uh, JavaScript, Perl, C, C++, C Sharp, any of these sort of modern high level languages. By all means, if you're sort of from um, the world of COBOL, Fortran, I mean, they're still programming languages. I'm sure you could figure this new stuff out. Um, but what we, it's a student coming into the course who only knows how to make websites in an aesthetic sense using HTML and PHP, or, HTML and CSS and maybe tools like Dreamweaver. We've had students take the course before and you know bootstrap themselves and learn as they go, but you will find yourself at a disadvantage at least in terms of time. So each of the projects we expect takes a student, say, 10, 20, 30 hours. There's only um, five of, uh, four of them during the term that are really meaty, and you have three weeks for each of them. So we sort of expect that the time is amortized over multiple weeks. But if you're coming in with no programming experience whatsoever, or maybe just have taken, say, E50A, I would expect you to be on the higher end of the time involved in the projects. But it's doable. And feel free to chat with me or the TFs after class if you're a little unsure of what you'd be getting yourselves into. Expectations. A tender watch all of the lectures, as the camera in the back of the room suggests. These lectures will be available online. So whether you're tuning in only online because you can't physically travel to campus, or you're here tonight but would rather not be here next time at night, um, the videos will be available within 72 hours on the course's website in uh, several different file formats. And all of the handouts will always be posted in usually PDF form. So pretty much you can um, engage with the class as almost as well remotely as you can perhaps in person. And you can even fast forward me if you stay at home. So implement five projects is the other. Four of them we will assign. Project Zero, uh, which will be distributed next Monday, is very low key. It will have you set up even an ugly website of your own at yourdomain.com. And as part of that, we'll provide you with this username and password, and you'll procure your domain name. It's project one, two, and three that we will assign very precise specifications for that constitute the meat of the course's work. And then the final project, the last, uh, will be almost entirely of your own design. So more on those in just a moment. So what are you going to learn or take away from 
in this class, or at least what are we going to chat about each week. So today is really about the basics, sort of talking about some of the lower level details, and then next week we'll dive into this language called PHP and actually building the first, if simple, of dynamic websites. And we'll spend a couple of lectures on that. Then we'll introduce in lectures three and four XML, which in and of itself not terribly interesting. It's open bracket, close bracket, and that's not all, uh, not much more than that. But thanks to the simplicity, thanks to the human readability, thanks to the extensibility of it, you can actually do some really useful things. So in fact, for project one, what we will have you use is not a real database in the SQL sense, but a flat file database. And by that, I just mean an ASCII text file that's going to be structured in a manner you decide. And it's going to be structured using XML. The reason being, sometimes you don't need the heavy-handed approach like an entire database to get a job done. One of the first projects will need a database of sorts, but as you'll see in the specification, the spin we give the project is that you're implementing this website for someone who's not very technical. And they're not going to be able to go create tables and navigate uh, cells in a table. They, they, they're kind of comfortable with Notepad or uh, text edit, something very simple. And so you need to implement the project in a way that they can maintain it after you wash your hands of the project. And for that, we'll use XML. It's a wonderfully useful if simple mechanism, even for implementing things like configuration files. Much of the course's website actually is itself driven by XML files because it's so damn quick. When we want to update something or post a link on the page, we open up Emacs or Vim or whatever, make one line of change to the file, save it, bam, the website updates itself. Whereas doing that in a database, just more unnecessary steps. So that'll be the trade-off. But with projects two and three, will we introduce MySQL and we'll sort of take things up a level as a result. But we will talk as part of this discussion of XML about uh, uh, this notion of DOM, document object model, which will come full circle to in our discussion of JavaScript and AJAX later in the course. Uh, browsers themselves expose what's called a DOM. Uh, XML itself can be represented with a DOM. We'll talk about a query language called XPath, which is a wonderfully useful query language with which to get at specific XML data that's increasingly being supportive. Um, we'll then transition to a more sophisticated database, if you will, um, and a query language known as SQL. And the specific database we'll use is MySQL, if only because it's probably the most popular uh, freely available database engine out there. But even then, the knowledge you would gain from getting experience with this is certainly uh, transferable to PostgreSQL or to uh, even Microsoft Access and SQL Server, Oracle. There's many, many similarities among all of these. But the upside of MySQL is that it's free, it's fast, and it's popular. And certainly, if you start hosting websites elsewhere after the course, it's usually these days MySQL that you get with that environment. We'll talk after that about JavaScript. And we'll talk about doing the simplest of things, like popping up annoying little pop-ups, to doing much more useful and much more sophisticated things, particularly in the context of AJAX. So the, the sexiest of websites these days, like Google Maps and Kayak.com, all gain their power from this, this technology, this confluence of technologies called AJAX, which once upon a time was asynchronous JavaScript and XML. Um, now it's a, you have other options besides XML. So we'll still come full circle there and revisit XML. But JSON, uh, JavaScript object notation, is another feature we'll discuss at that point in the term as another mechanism for transferring data from server to browser without refreshing the whole web page. We'll talk at the, toward the conclusion of the course then even though we'll, we'll lace these topics throughout the lectures, but we'll focus in particular on security, what you need to think about, what you need to realize, and how you might go about breaking into your own websites. And we'll talk about scalability um, in great focus in the last lecture, too, how you can take this site or your next great site and actually scale it out. And we'll talk about things like firewalls and load balancers and routers and switches and those kinds of details as well. So in what form will these things come? Oh, bad segue sections. So in addition to these lectures once a week, we will also have one or more sections each week, which if unfamiliar will be uh, more intimate classes uh, led by the course's teaching fellows. One of these sections a week will be filmed. So even if you are not able to attend the sections that are on campus or you're physically not even proximal, one of those sections will similarly be posted online, uh, made available in video format within 72 hours. But then on campus too, we'll have a gathering each week. Um, well, let me introduce at least two of the course's teaching fellows. Uh, if Andrew and uh, John, want to come up for just a moment and say hello? And then this form you will have all dressed in just a moment. Hi, everyone. I'm John. <laughs> I'm Andrew. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Well, John and Andrew. So you'll get to know them both better. Um, as well. So um, no need to distract yourselves too much. But before you leave tonight, we'll ask that you turn in this form 
Um, and it's simply trying to get a sense uh, and mass of what people's schedules are like. And as we disclaim on the form, we'll do our best to choose an optimal time for as many people as possible, but we'll fall back on the existence of the videos for those of you who just can't or can, uh, don't want to actually come to campus for these sections as well. And it's in sections that you'll be able to ask questions about uh, things we discussed in lecture, go over examples in more detail, focus specifically on the projects so that you know where to begin and how to dive in and how to tackle some of the challenges therein. So it's meant to give you yet another angle on the course's material. And what we do ask to take a guess as to how likely uh, you are to even attend section because we will obviously, those of you who really like sections in this academic environment, will try to make sure that we optimize for those as well. So what about the project? So Project Zero is meant to be fairly low key so that we can sort of build up uh, some body of knowledge early in the semester about again DNS and HTTP and a little HTML and CSS, but also PHP and XML. And Project Zero is pretty much, as you'll see next week, just going to ask you to buy your own domain name, guess again for just a few dollars, get yourself set up on the course's VPS, and also just put something at yourdomainname.com. Put a website out there. It doesn't have to be a work of art, but at least you'll go through the motions of getting yourself up on that internet. Uh, which is itself perhaps rewarding if you've never done it before. But it's in project one that we'll start putting to the test some dynamic websites. Project zeros will be fairly static, ones will begin to be dynamic. And the playful name we've given it is Pizza ML. We will give you the menu from a popular restaurant nearby called Three Aces, great pizzas and subs there. And um, they also have a very nice, if confusing, menu of subs you can buy, pizzas, salads, and whatnot. And despite the um, actually, it's one of those places where it's kind of overwhelming how many choices they have. We will disclaim that you don't need to implement the whole menu. Just a few items from each category will suffice, since the course's goal is not to be um, annoying. Um, but you'll see that there's some non-obvious design decisions you'll have to make. So there's some items there where uh, with one sub you can get anchovies optionally. Well, how do you implement the notion of optionality when you shouldn't be allowed to put anchovies on, say, a meatball sub? And so there's going to be some design constraints you're going to have to impose on the data. And you're going to have to implement your own database, so to speak, for this menu in XML format. Because the website that's then going to use this data is going to be a online ordering system. So the setup in this project will be that the folks at Three Aces right now, which rely only on telephone, maybe fax machine to receive orders, they want to get themselves on the internet. And to do this, they've called upon you to take this menu and make something happen with it so that people can go to their website, add items to a shopping cart, and then actually check out. And uh, presumably, the orders would then be transmitted to Three Aces. And we're going to stop short of transmitting these orders to them at all. But what you'll get is hopefully a very representative example of a well-defined problem that even one of your friends, uh, being a computer person, asks you to go help them with and will solve that problem using PHP and XML. In project two, you will implement your own E-Trade like uh, stock portfolio management tool. So you'll implement a website that has usernames and passwords. When you log in, you'll see your account portfolio. By default, your users will get maybe $10,000 of virtual cash, and they can then buy and sell stocks using their portfolio. But what we're going to have you do is integrate with a live data feed from Yahoo Finance, which exposes their data in this very trivial file format known as CSV, which stands for comma separated variables, which even more so than XML lends itself to very easy parsing or processing so that you can integrate um, in near real time real stock quotes from Yahoo. So um, might want to spend the semester shorting all of the stocks there perhaps, but you will see that you'll actually get some nice integration with a real world data feed and it will ultimately allow you to check stock quotes, buy stocks, sell stocks, and perhaps we'll uh, try to turn it into a bit of competition to see who can either do the worst or the best uh, over the course of the semester with our own staff implementation thereof. In project three, you're going to implement one of these very trendily named mashups, um, where we're going to have you take uh, Google Maps' API, Application Programming Interface, and their Google News service, mash them together, so to speak, so that you get a website that shows a map centered on your hometown, but with little markers for the five or so largest cities that are currently within view of the map. And what's going to happen by Project Send is that if you click any one of those markers, you're going to see current news from that particular zip code based on whatever Google News is currently making available, as it would so happen, by RSS. So RSS is really just XML. So again, you'll find that there are these common threads throughout many of the projects, even while we raise the bar. Because what you'll also do in this project is uh, not only use MySQL for CS75 Finance to store any number of users' portfolios and transaction history. For Google Mashup, we're also going to give you 
um, a large zip code database that we bought for a few dollars that has zip codes, that has populations, that has city states and names and a whole bunch of other information. We're going to give you a big CSV file, going to say, OK, your turn. Get this into a MySQL database, because it's going to be several tens of thousands of lines long. There's a lot of zip codes out there. Um, and you're going to have to get it into a more manageable form in a MySQL table. And then you're going to use that data to figure out, no matter where the user is zoomed in on the United States, you're going to figure out essentially the top left-hand corner in GPS coordinates, the bottom right-hand corner in GPS coordinates. You're then going to do a lookup in this database whose coordinates we will associate with zip codes, figure out what the five biggest cities are in there, plop some markers down, grab some news from Google Maps, and voila. You have a real world mashup, um, similar in spirit to some things you might have seen out there involving Craigslist and apartment listings, same kind of idea. And it's in this one that we'll focus on, again, this, this trendy technology known as Ajax, which really just means using JavaScript in a very clever way, using XML, using uh, JSON, JavaScript object notation, to inter make a much more seamless user interface, which is ultimately the value add of Ajax. And then the final project in the last few weeks of the course will be pretty much of your own design. We'll ask you to seek our approval for the project so that we can help you gauge how much you're biting off, whether it's too little or too much. And then again, the climax of the course will be this computer science fair held jointly with the uh, digital photography class where all of you, and hopefully those of you even uh, from afar, if you would like to make plans to visit campus on May 18th uh, for a couple of hours, we'll book a large space on campus and have a nice uh, sort of culmination to the course, demoing each other's final projects, which will be out there on the real World Wide Web. So any questions about the lectures or projects? Anything at all? All right, so what kind of support structure exists besides the lectures and the sections? Well, um, this is a course where you do not need books. So there's, there are no books required. You don't have to go out and buy books, even though we're going to recommend um, several of them. Um, let me make clear that on the resources page of the course's website at cs75.net, we've linked to what we feel are some of the best free resources out there. And absolutely, you can get by with just those resources. But if you're the type of person who takes great comfort knowing that there's a book to go home to, a book you can read front to back so that you can really wrap your mind around the materials, we're, we're off, we suggest, recommend, uh, one of two sets. So if you're coming into the course among those less comfortable, so to speak, you have less programming experience, you're the type of person in this room who if you're looking to the left or right, you're pretty sure both of them know more than you about the material, these might be books that hold your hand a bit more than the other set we're about to recommend. They're still nice and bite-sized. It's pretty much one of those books where you open any page and on the left and right hand side it tells you it teaches you how to make a drop-down menu or how to implement a username password. And you get very bite-sized lessons in the book with some screenshots of browsers and stuff like that. Um, feel free to flip around. Some of them, you can do that thing on Amazon where you look inside at some excerpts. Take a look. Um, we haven't put them on the shelves at the Coop because you will pay much, much more money if you do it that way. But poke around online. We link in the syllabus to Amazon. And these books, especially if you get them used, are $10, some of them 15 These aren't your $80 textbooks here. But if you're coming into the course, course, more savvy, um, you think that you'd be bored with something that's a little more rudimentary, this is a really nice set of what we'd call reference books. They're similarly bite-sized in that every page or pair of pages pretty much teaches you one thing, but it assumes even less. It holds your hands less, and it's the kind of book that's probably a more valuable long-term reference. And so we've even offered up um, recommendations on this book on Apache. You yourselves, because we, the staff, will be uh, sysadmining the server, you won't really need to touch Apache configuration files. We'll do that for you, but most everything else you yourselves would touch. And if you're coming into the course unfamiliar with Linux, but you'd like to use this as a forced opportunity to learn it, and therefore you want to SSH, you want to SFTP, because you've just never done this before, you don't have to for the course, but that's a wonderful little, you know, uh, two millimeter kind of or two centimeter kind of book as well. Uh, to pick up as a reference. So feel free to check either of those sets out. The links uh, in the syllabus have ISBNs and all those details. So what else? So we'll also, throughout the semester, offer office hours um, pretty much on demand. If you'd ever like to sit down with me or one of the teaching fellows, we'll typically do this by appointment. Otherwise, we end up being very socially awkward in a room all by ourselves when no one shows up. So simply dropping a note to help at cs75.net or us individually. All of our addresses will soon appear on the staff page on the website. We'll, um, 
we'll be happy to set up an appointment. But those of you who would like to not come to campus for such help or who can't come to campus for such help know that last year we instituted what we dub uh, virtual office hours thanks to some Java based software. So we're using a tool uh, by a company called Illuminate. Um, it's a free download via the course's website. It's a Java application, so it runs on Windows, Mac OS, or Linux, no matter what you're running. And it's a glorified chat room. But it's a little more than that. So if, when you, if and when you decide to log into this to meet with one of the staff members to chat about problem sets or material, you'll see yourself appear in the top left of this window. You can chat with us or other students in the bottom left. But we can also pull you into private breakout rooms, so to speak, and we can see what's on your screen if you give us permission. So it's sort of like remote, remote technical support. But it's useful for us because we can actually see your terminal window, or we can help you reconfigure things, and you'll be watching everything we do, much like Dell or whomever would while trying to fix your home PC. So that's another tool we'll make available on demand uh, so that we can help you from afar. And it actually works surprisingly well. Even last spring, one of our students went away um, to China for a couple of weeks. And it actually, the bandwidth was such that we were able to interact with her um, with decently low latency uh, even that far away. So it works pretty well. So it's a neat tool. The website at www.cs75.net will contain most anything and everything you need to succeed in the course or catch up in the course. So on the lectures page already, you'll see not only the schedule, but the handouts uh, beyond the sectioning form that are available tonight. Uh, you will see uh, links to sections and a calendar for office hours. So as we start populating this, we've integrated a little Google Calendar into the site that you can check out there. The projects themselves will be distributed via PDFs on this site here as well. So you can always check there for deadlines and such. But perhaps two of the most useful pages are the software page where we'll maintain links and just a few links to software that we think is wonderfully useful, not just for the course, but afterward. In fact, um, I've not been one to sort of get into the silly uh, religious arguments over browsers, but when it comes to web development, Firefox is hands down a wonderful tool because of all of the freely available plugins that exist for it. So what you'll see over the course of the semester is me using things like this free plugin called Live HTTP Headers, which lets you sniff your own traffic, which is going to be really useful when you're trying to see what your forms are actually submitting to the server, what your AJAX requests are actually sending to the server, because you can watch all of this. So it's wonderfully useful there. Uh, you'll see things like Firebug, uh, all use which is a wonderful website uh, debugging tool for JavaScript, for HTML stuff, for CSS stuff. Another one of my more recent favorites is this one. It's one of these toolbars, web developer toolbar, and even little things. So I try to often, when working on websites, make sure it works on different size browsers. Well, just clicking a link like this now gave me an 800 by 600 pixel window, which in its simplicity is wonderfully useful. And you can do some really neat things. Um, one other teaser I'll show you here just so you can get a sense of how much data is actually accessible to you, a developer. If I go to the CSS menu of this free plugin, go to, I think, uh, view style information. So notice now, as I hover over these links, there's different divs on the page, if you're familiar with HTML. And what it's showing me is the sort of back-end structural content here. And I'm kind of curious, you know, what uh, font has uh, David used to implement the website here? If you double click, Notice that now it shows me all of the CSS style sheets that are applicable to just that block of code. So if you've ever wondered, what, what font is this website using? Or what font size is this? Or how did they do this alignment? I mean, this tool alone saves you from downloading usually half a dozen CSS files and JS files and trying to walk your way through it, which these days is just almost impossible because there's just so much content. But it's wonderful. What this now has showed me is that we apparently, the course website, are using a uh, handy library from Yahoo that will also promote a lot because it's wonderfully cross-platform. We'll save you some headaches. We have a course.css file, which is doing a bit of uh, structural stuff. We have a theme file, which is called styles.css at that path. And there's some more stuff that's applicable. So if you've never dabbled in these tools too, hopefully just the exposure in this course to some really powerful tools out there will itself be a nice takeaway if you've never dabbled. So it's wonderful how much you can teach yourself about other websites thanks to tools like these. So all of these you'll see will be linked on the course's website uh, here. So let me go ahead. 
Uh, turn that off and resources. So what you will also find, and we'll probably narrow this list a little bit because it's getting a little unwieldy, um, we've provided links to tutorials and references so that the first place you should turn when you have want to chase down an answer to a question is probably at least to our resources page. Since you're welcome to Google certainly, but we've tried to really point you toward what we think are some pretty solid references out there. And soon, once you have your own accounts on CS75.net, a new link will appear to a course course bulletin board where you'll be able to interact with each other and the course's staff so that when you have questions, ideally you won't route them privately to us over email, which then means others are not perhaps benefiting from that same question. But assuming it's not a question of the form, what's wrong with my code, but rather how do I achieve x, where it's appropriate for a more open forum, um, you'll be able to post with other students there. And if you're of the less comfortable type, you'll be able to anonymize your name so you're just Joe student posting and not disclosing who it is that's asking all these questions every day. So we'll see who you are, but not each other. So you get a little comfort from that. Um, any questions on that? No? OK, so let's just lay the foundation for where we'll begin next week. So HTTP, again, is the language or the protocol, more properly, that browsers and servers speak to one another. And we've seen a hint of that today in the form of the headers that are going back and forth across the wire. Some of those headers are just generated automatically by the server, generated automatically by the browser. But many you have control over, like the host line or the location, rather, like the location line that we saw when it came to HTTP direct redirection. So we'll see that there's this function in PHP called header that allows you to spit out arbitrary types of headers. We'll see, too, when it comes to security, that there's some things that you might not want going across the wire. So if I go ahead and clear this cache and pull up our own home page again and scroll up to the very top, notice that among the things the server spit out are things like um, the fact that I'm running Apache 2. Now, this may or may not actually be a security risk, but there's certain headers that it's just not necessary to spit them out. Because why do you need to tell the world what type of web server software you're running? If they're, uh, the, what, what's the motivation, incidentally, for this? Like, why should you probably err on the side of telling less to the world? Even though a smart adversary could probably still figure it out. Yeah, just less likely to get hacked, right? If there is, if this were even more specific and said you were running Apache version 2.027 and the world discovers a serious buffer overflow bug in that version of Apache, just why bother lowering the bar to people with too much free time out there who want to find servers running that specific version because they want to send some bogus packets to you in hopes of compromising the server. Another popular header that we've turned off is this x colon, uh, hyphen powered by PHP. Well, who really cares? Like, it's nice branding for the PHP folks, but do we really need to, one, inform the world what language we're using server side, and two, for a scalable website, if you take this 15, 20 byte string multiplied by n hits per day, where if n is a million, that's what a million, it's 20 million bytes, 20 megabytes that you're sending over the wire for no good reason. So there's things like this that you'll be able to bear in mind after the course, again, about security, scalability that you might just not have thought of beforehand. Um, XHTML. So what we will expect in this course is use of XHTML, whether it's the strict flavor or the transitional flavor, if you're familiar with this. If you're coming at the course with no familiarity of XHTML, not a big deal. HTML is sort of the sloppy version of XHTML. So whereas in HTML, you uh, don't have to close tags. You can do a uh, open bracket, br, close bracket, and that's your line break tag. Well, in XHTML, you're going to have to open that tag and close it either by using the empty element form, which is in the form of, rather than waste time moving the screen up and down, we'll use the wonderful tool of WordPad. Rather than just do this here, you'll have to do either the ridiculous looking that, but more conventionally, people do this. And you have an empty element where you simultaneously open and close the tag. Whereas in HTML, you can do things like, um, Let's say, uh, how about body bg color equals uh, white? Well, in XHTML, you've got to quote things like this. bg color equals quote unquote white, or body bg color equals single quote white, single quote, and so on. So there's a much, there's more, XHTML is much more proper. It's so much nicer for a computer, a parser, to actually understand because it's, defined, it's very well defined by a grammar. Um, whereas HTML, and fortunately browsers are very forgiving these days, 
um, is a much sloppier language. So it's a good habit, if nothing else, to get into. And there's really nothing you can do with HTML that you can't also do with XHTML. So we'll touch on this briefly over time, but it's not something that's particularly hard to pick up on. CSS we'll also talk about um, from time to time in the course. But again, we sort of expect that people are coming into the course with some familiarity with this stuff. The course ultimately cares more about um, the uh, interesting aspects of logic and design, not so much about aesthetics. So you will be free to implement even the, most, the ugliest, aesthetically speaking, websites that you wish. Apparently, we have some experts in the back. <laughs> um, but that's OK. We care much more about the underlying functionality. We care that your code is pretty. We care that your code is correct. But if what you're uh, spitting out is the, the equivalent of the blink tag and some hideous matchings of color, I mean, that's fine. We're not, you're not going to be graded on the beauty of your work, um, at least on a high level, aesthetic level. We care more about the programmatic aspects. So with that said, while we might touch upon things like CSS for structural reasons and aesthetic reasons and sections, for the most part, if you want to learn a little more about the aesthetics of CSS and even XHTML, we would refer you to Google or to Q&A with the staff or each other. We'll focus more on the programmatic aspects here. But there, it is worth noting um, a couple aspects of validity. So, so that we can standardize as best as possible the, the evaluation of projects and make the grading of things as objective as possible, there are certain metrics that we'll expect. So beyond implementing things in XHTML, we'll expect that your H XHTML is what's called uh, valid. So you can use tools out there. And this is the URL of one with which you can validate your XHTML. And all this means is that the XHTML you're writing is actually correct. Now, it doesn't mean it's going to display OK in browsers. It means that according to the organization called the uh, W3C, there is a very specific document out there called the DTD, Document Type Definition, that says this is what correct XHTML looks like. And so we'll expect in turn that the XHTML you produce is in fact correct. And the upside is free tools exist with which to answer that question long before you actually turn it in. But it's all toward an end of ultimately not just being anal and for the sake of making grading easier, but rather it's a good practice to get into as the world tries to push people more and more toward web standards and to actually implementing um, correct websites and not just ones that the browsers over the years have just very generously gotten into the habit of displaying. But one headache you will inevitably Run into this, run into in this course, not so much because of us, but because of the realities of the day. Um, to this day, even as browsers advance to versions three of Firefox and seven and eight of IE, it's a nightmare trying to implement websites that work properly on multiple different browsers. And even though the problems have gotten a little more sophisticated, JavaScript inconsistencies or CSS inconsistencies, what we will expect of projects uh, uh, zero through three is that your websites render properly on at least two major browsers. So you'll use IE and Firefox, Firefox and Chrome, Safari. Uh, you'll be given a choice. Opera is another one. So any of the major browsers in the current versions, you'll be expected to inform us which one should we uh, test out your website with, but we're not going to make you bang your head against the wall getting it to work on all possible browsers. I think that would uh, belabor the point too much. But it's a wonderful, if frustrating, exercise to trip over some of these inconsistencies now when it's sort of a safe environment than when it actually matters. Um, this day of, and even Harvard has certain websites which say, Maybe even some of the big engines, like you, this website only works properly in Internet Explorer. Like That's not really acceptable. Um, and it doesn't have to be that way. So um, we will expect that it not be. CSS also has a validator that perhaps doesn't work as reliably, but uh, such tools exist. Um, uh, we will introduce into this course uh, discussions about cross-platform development as often as we can. Because there are, fortunately, some wonderful people out there um, in companies and also in uh, just their basements working on tools and libraries that make our lives easier. So uh, Yahoo has their YUI library, which is a set of JavaScript uh, modules and a set of CSS files that is their attempt to make it much easier to develop code that behaves the same on Safari and on Firefox and on Chrome and on IE and so forth. So for instance, what you saw our own course website downloading before was one of these Yahoo files. So they have a set of files called their reset library. And what they've done, just through a whole lot of trial and effort on their, their part, they've figured out what style sheet rules, if embedded in your website, makes everything look 
the same by default. So in other words, if you have an H1 element, which the heading 1, it's going to look the same font size. It's going to look the same boldface nature, the same centered nature on every possible browser so that you yourself don't have to deal with the minutia of getting things to work across multiple platforms. So there's other tools like this, but Yahoo has done a wonderful job at open sourcing all of this material, even hosting the code. Google now co-hosts their code as well so that you can integrate it into your website. And you can think of it these libraries in particular are just a really quick way of leveling the playing field that eliminate a whole lot of inconsistencies. If you've ever dabbled even with the aesthetics of website design, you'll notice stupid things like the amount of white space below your form elements is a few pixels more on this browser and a few pixels less on the other. You'll find that sometimes you have a, a four pixel border around your whole page. You'll find that sometimes using 100% doesn't actually fill the page as you would hope it would, but again, because of different design decisions, Mozilla and uh, Fire and I, and Microsoft and others have made. These are wonderful attempts, free attempts for you to sort of get past some of those headaches. So we'll also point you toward those things. And it's as simple as embedding tags like these um, in your website. Um, fonts as well. Oh, one of the upsides too of fonts here is that uh, gone, it's, it's not ideal, for instance, to hard code. My font size on my site will be 10 pixels, 10px or 11px. It might look perfect, but it's really bad for accessibility purposes or certain browsers that don't allow you to override these things. So for people who just can't see as well or who need the fonts increased, you know, saying, sorry, I, because my site looks prettiest at 11 pixels, you're stuck with it, like not the best solution there for accessibility. So there are better ways using the EM uh, relative marker, uh, using the percent sign that, again, these libraries facilitate. So again, get past what are otherwise headaches. So the only snippet of HTML that will XHTML that we'll introduce tonight are some of these basic building blocks that we'll start relying on a great deal. Probably you've you certainly used forms before. You go to google.com, bam, you have your very first form on that website. Um, you click that submit button, what's happening? An HTTP request is being generated from client to server and is transmitting some number of HTTP parameters. Well, we'll spend more time next week on exposing how all that works, but you're familiar with these basic features of text fields, password fields, hidden fields, well, perhaps not so much hidden fields, check boxes, radio buttons, drop down menus. It's really these basic building blocks that are going to form the foundation of all things dynamic that we do. Any form of input that you ultimately provide uh, from client to server is usually going to come in the form of these things. But even as we move toward Ajax, things will become a little uh, more dynamic, a little sexier, whereby there is no user interfacing, but it's your own code that's generating additional requests for, co uh, for data. Um, so our own websites in the course will get more sophisticated still. So we will dive in next Monday, not only into a discussion of Project Zero, but also to our first lecture on PHP. Uh, the TFs and I will stick around uh, tonight, but why don't we adjourn a little early and stick around ourselves if you have any questions. But we'll see you next week, hopefully.